It's Phil Steele Friday. I'm Scott Callan. That's Wesley Euler filling in for Jed Drenning. We'll have Phil talking about this week's Big 12 matchups, top 25, and of course, the coal rush game between West Virginia and Iowa State. Hang tight. We'll get things started here in just a minute. You are now watching Believe. R-T-G. With special guest, Phil Steele. Author of the College Football Bible. Bible. You can see things before they happen. Well, I definitely like West Virginia's offensive line. All you got to do is bet on the winner and you'll never lose. I like the Mountaineers to win this one. Taylor, touchdown! To me, the key matchup here is that West Virginia run game. Hey, a real pleasure being on. Thanks for having me on the In the Gun podcast. Once you enter this family, it's no getting out. In the Gun, episode 199. It's hard to believe we are on the eve, knocking on the door of episode 200, which will be the Iowa State recap, as I mentioned in the beginning. That is Wes Euler. That's not Jed Draining. You didn't get younger overnight. but <laughs> Or handsomer. <laughs> or handsomer. But we will have Phil here in just a few moments. But before we do, a, a shout-out to Bet Online. Make sure to get your wagers in at Bet Online where the game starts. And also a thank you to Toothman Ford. We all know cars cost less in Grafton. So, Wes, obviously you weren't part of these picks last week. We're going to go ahead and get a, uh, a recap of how Jed and I did. And at the end of the show, you'll get to place your wager. So, oh, yeah. Uh, ITG Sportsbook, which is uh, under construction, I believe. <laughs> I think we should have a website here in a couple of years. But Pending, pending sponsorship. Yes, pending sponsorship. So, uh, last week, Jed asked Ollie Gordon uh, 21 and a half carries over or under. We both went under. Ollie Gordon stayed under with 13. He obviously got hurt in the game. Even if he probably stayed in the game, though, he probably would have probably stayed under that total just because of how the game was getting out of control there for them. Uh, Didn't have a whole lot of success either. 50 yards total on the day. Uh, will West Virginia have a sack? Oklahoma State had only given up one sack the entire year heading into that game. We both said yes, they will. West Virginia ended up with two. That was for Torma Mulba and Hammond Russell. And then finally, uh, the total yards combined between West Virginia and Oklahoma State, 873 and a half was the over under. Uh, a, a pretty healthy number there. I went under, Jed went over. The combined yardage was 785. West Virginia with the 558 to 227 edge, and I, I it sounds like a big number, West, but like I I think going into we we all kind of thought this was going to be a back and forth high scoring Mm -hmm. affair, and it just never turned into that. No, it didn't. I mean, it it did for the Mountaineers; they did their part, but but yeah, that is. I mean, that's a big number, 873 and a half, (laughs) and I, I mean, what 785 combined? So it's not like. It wasn't even close, but it wasn't really that close. You still needed almost yeah. 100 yards still to hit that mark. Um, if Oklahoma State does typical Oklahoma State things, I think you could have seen that happening. Um, but, man, shout out to that Mountaineer defense. We know, obviously, Owen, or uh, um, they – sorry, I almost gave credit to Owen for no reason, but I just <laughs> meant to say – uh, the Mountaineer defense uh, had the best results of a Big 12 team this week. Defense of the week, if you will, in terms of points given up for our pickums that we also do uh, on the episodes. So uh, most rushing yards in the conference for WVU, best defensive output uh, for WVU. I, I think we were all very pleasantly surprised by that. I, I think we we thought they could do some things to give Oklahoma State some grief because that was on tape, you know, through their their first handful of games, but not to hold them to just 227 yards. Pretty pretty stinking good. Yeah, especially when you're running for 389. I don't think anyone saw that coming. And as I've said no. multiple times this week, I, I think the most optimistic West Virginia fan probably would have said you left Stillwater with like a a one score win. Or right. you just find right. a way to get to get the win and, and leave Stillwater. But 38 to 14, you run for 389. I believe it's the second most a Mike Gundy coach team has ever given up. I think the other was to Texas AM way, way back in the day or in his early days. But mm-hmm. impressive day. And uh hopefully the Mountaineers can carry that over to uh what they have this weekend with Iowa State rolling into town 
uh, against the number 11 team in the country. So, Sky, yeah, just real quick. I mean, so yeah. such an impressive day for the WVU defense that the announcers were talking about Ollie Gordon sitting out the rest of the yeah. season. Like I they were the, was... the the broadcast crew was telling yeah. Ollie Gordon to make business decisions. That's when you know you're kicking some booty. Yeah, I I thought that was absurd uh, when he said that, and and I was like, am I the only one that thinks that this is a little bit ridiculous that he's no, saying? I think it's right I think it's a little bit ridiculous for a play by play broadcaster to encourage a guy to sit yes. out for a whole rest of the year. But when I'm on the other side of it, I love it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we all understand his point of view, certainly. But in my frame of mind, I'm thinking like, well, dang, like it's not really Ollie. Yeah, that's Ollie not really hasn't his place to say something no. like that. Yeah. I mean, Ollie hasn't been himself this year. And if you look at some of the top running backs in the draft for next year, there's there's like six or seven of them that might go in Good the first crop. three or four rounds. Yeah. So if I'm Ollie yeah. Gordon, I'm going to keep playing to try and break out of this so I can raise my stock again. Completely but, agree. Yeah, and you you didn't come back to kind of putter through the first five or six games of the year and, and, and sit out, right? Like, yeah. obviously, he cares about the program. He cares about this season deeply, or he would have just gone to the NFL already. Exactly. But what do we know? Apparently, what do we uh, know? I'm not in a room with Ollie Gordon. All I know is that the next time that bro- – because you know how it is, too. Those broadcasters, yeah. when they do games, they, like, meet with the coaching staffs the night before and stuff to get information and all that. The next That's going to be that an bro- interesting The up. next time that broadcaster does an <laughs> Oklahoma State game, I would not want to be him having to sit down with Mike Gundy and company, and they're like, so let's talk about what you said about Ollie Gordon last time you called one of our games. <laughs> yeah. No fun. That's going to be awkward. Yeah. Absolutely will. Uh, all right. One more thank you here before we get to a quick break to bring Phil in, and that is uh, to Fortis for Roof Performance and Financial Certainty Guaranteed. Make sure to visit Fortis.us.com. Hang around. We'll have Phil Steele. He's going to talk top 25, Big 12, and West Virginia, Iowa State. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations. With more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit Fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Nobody supports the blue and gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guaranteed to save you thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, we're car cost less in Grafton and at toothman4.com. Back in the gun with Phil Steele. It's time to break down some of the best matchups around college football. And at the end, we'll get his thoughts on West Virginia and the Cyclones from Iowa State. Phil, thanks for joining us for another week here on ITG. Go ahead and feel uh, free to plug anything you got going on on the website this week. Yeah, I appreciate that. Once again, uh, up right now on philsteele.com, you can take the Phil Steele Plus Tour with selections. And I've got a double guarantee this week. The selections must have a winning week or you get next week's Inside the Press Box free. And the quick hitters must have a winning week or you get this week's NFL Inside the Press Box free. Both a $20 value. The tour is absolutely free, but guaranteed winners. Just go to philsteel.com, click on the Phil Steel Plus Tour and take the tour and get the guarantees. All right, Phil, so let's go and get started with some top 25 action. And when Jed sent over the games for this week, I was like, why is this not in the Big 12 uh, category? And then I forgot for a half a second, (laughs) Red River Rivalry (laughs) is now in the SEC. So we got Texas and Oklahoma. The Longhorns regain that top spot in the top 25. And Oklahoma comes into this one at 4-1. and Everyone talks about the Texas offense, and rightfully so, but that defense is pretty stingy as well. I don't know if Oklahoma's got enough firepower to hang in this one. Is is this one where they just got to hope and pray that it's a game in the fourth quarter? 
Yeah, I think so. And, you know, when I, I look at these two teams, I look at it, if the game was just on paper, nameless, faceless teams, and you look at the stats and how the teams have performed, Texas should win this game by three touchdowns because Oklahoma's offense has not performed well this year. Texas is playing great defense. They've got the explosive offense. Oklahoma does have a really good defense. However, this is Texas and Oklahoma, and I've been following this series for years, <laughs> and it's always tight. In fact, you know that uh, I believe it's 11 of the last 12 years this game has been decided by eight points or less. Only once has it not. So you could throw the records. They say that for a lot of rivalry games. You could say that for here. Throw the records out the window. In fact, uh, the last five times the team has been a double-digit underdog in the game, they have not only covered, but uh, uh, I think – Two or three of the times they've actually won outright. So this is a pure underdog series. I love the stadium. I love how it's split for the game. And I think it's going to be a really good game. Oklahoma's going to give their best shot. they got a really good defense. I like how Michael Hawkins is taken. So I'll take Oklahoma uh, plus the 14 and a half to make a game of this one. Interesting one, Phil, in the new Big Ten. You know, Skylar mentioned kind of the new SEC there. The new Big Ten, Penn State traveling to Southern California to take on USC. We heard James Franklin talking about how they have to bus out of a different airport this week. They're leaving on Thursday. Uh, are the Penn State Nittany Lions for that game on Saturday? Uh, Phil, Penn State is a team, top five in the country, 5-0, and undefeated but maybe haven't quite put in the type of dominating, impressive performances that their fan base has been looking for. What do you expect when the Nittany Lions travel out West for the first time uh, to take on the Trojans? Yeah, I think Penn State's worthy of being number five in the country, and they do have the more complete team, especially at the line of scrimmage. I think when you look at the offensive line, defensive line, that's where Penn State has the best edge in this game. Uh, Nicholas Singleton didn't play last week against UCLA. They could easily have won that game by more. Uh, they settled for some field goals, gave up a late touchdown uh, in the game. But uh, this is a, a Penn State team that uh, I think is the better team. However, USC's not a bad team, and they could easily have beaten Michigan on the road. And last week they led Minnesota by seven in the fourth quarter. They've got Miller Moss. Uh, they've got dangerous weapons on offense, and they have an improved defense this year with Danton Lynn as the defensive coordinator. So I think it's going to be a really good game. I, I've got Penn State come, going out there and win it by three. I believe the spread's up close to a touchdown here. So I'll take USC plus the points, but I do like Penn State to escape with the win. Death Valley is always a tough place to play for opponents, but if there's anyone that's going to go in there and find a way to pull out a W, I wouldn't be surprised if it's this Ole Miss, Ole Miss bunch and Lane Kiffin. Uh, the, the Rebs stubbed their toe a couple of weeks ago against Kentucky, but they bounced back last week against South Carolina. LSU really haven't been tested since the opener outside of that South Carolina, the game where they had to make that come from behind win on the road. How do you see this matchup playing out between a couple of four and one teams in the SEC? Yeah, and I think it's a really good situation for LSU this week. They're at home at night in Death Valley, which, as you know, they're always extremely tough there. They're also fresh off a bye. Meanwhile, Ole Miss is playing a seventh straight week, a second straight road game this week. I do think Ole Miss is the better team. I think the offenses are both strong. Ole Miss has the edge on defense. But I just love the situation for LSU. And I also like the fact that this is a series where, as you would expect, the home team is dominated. The home team is actually uh, nine and two straight up and 10 and one against the spread. Plenty of upsets. LSU's getting over a field goal at home. I think that uh, they could trade punches with Ole Miss all day. I'll take LSU plus the points in an upset. And the uh, the big one, of course, this weekend, Phil, number two, Ohio State against number three, Oregon. Uh, now a Big Ten matchup out there at Autzen Stadium. Two of the best teams in the country, two of the best rosters in the country uh, in what could be one of the more entertaining games of the season. How do you think the Buckeyes and the Ducks plays out? You know, it's interesting with Oregon. They're usually a team that puts opponents away in the fourth quarter. This Oregon team has been letting teams hang. You look at that UCLA game two weeks ago, probably should have been 35-3 to at the half. They had the ball up 28-3 to at the four-yard line, give up an interception return for a touchdown. Then surprisingly, 
only six points in the second half. And once again, last week, you're up 31 to nothing on Michigan State and allowed 10 late points, including a field goal uh, in the final seconds, which cost them to cover. But overall, Oregon's playing a lot better than they did at the start of the year. And really, when you take a look at those games at the start of the year, they outgained Idaho 487 to 217, had a 31 to 10 first down edge. They just only won the game by 10. And then Boise's a really good team that took them to the wire at home. Uh, I like this Oregon team, and they play very well against top 10 teams. Ohio State's got a tough travel trip here. Watson Stadium, one of the toughest venues out there. I think talent-wise, these teams are very close. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call this one right down to the wire. So I'm going to take the home dog here, plus the points in a possible upset. Uh, I like Oregon, plus the points here. All right, so let's move over into the best conference in all of college football. That is the Big 12. <laughs> and let's start with two of the new newcomers in the league, Utah and Arizona State, kicking off at 1030 tonight. Utah, 4-1, uh, and one, but have had some offensive issues, especially a quarterback. I don't know if there's a Cam Rising update out there. It seems like it's a day-by-day -day thing for the last several weeks now. Uh, but Arizona State, flying under the radar, 4-1, and one, have a massive home game here this could be a signature win for Kenny Dillingham and company if they can find a way to get on top and and, and put the Utah uh, Utes to rest here. Yeah, and, you know, the Cam Rising situation, he's supposed to be questionable, but I'm not going to fall for that banana in the tailpipe yeah. routine again. Uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure Isaac Wilson's the starting QB here. But, uh, when I look at the, the matchup, I still think Utah is a stronger team. And you take go back and take a look at how these teams have matched up recently. Utah has won the last four games against Arizona State. And not only won the games, but they've won them by an average of um, – 30 points per game last year they were 25.5 points per game last year they won 55 to 3 I still think they're the stronger team I know they're off a disappointing loss against Arizona and that one probably could have turned out different about with Utah's first three drives they had three long drives twice they got stopped on downs and once they settled for a field goal I think they blew their opportunities in that one off a bye off a loss I'll take Utah to go on the road and get the win you know in the preseason Utah probably would have been a 10 to 14 point favorite here so I'll take advantage of the line value I I like Utah in this one Cincinnati at UCF uh Phil UCF coming off that rivalry loss if you will to the Florida Gators Cincinnati coming off the bye week both of these teams three and two on the regular season maybe a little bit of a crossroads a, a separation Saturday for two programs um who want to continue to stay above 500 how you see this one playing out in Orlando yeah, and it is a, a big game for both, as you mentioned. Now, UCF has been losing a couple of players these last couple of weeks yeah. uh, that have used the uh, portal, including their kicker, Colton Boomer. So, you know, they're, they're maybe a little bit depleted. And I also haven't been overwhelmed with K.J. Jefferson this year. He's hitting 59% with a 7-4 ratio. He's been okay uh, running the football. Meanwhile, Brendan Sorsby looks great for Cincinnati. Got a 12-1 ratio. He's hitting 80 or 66% of his passes. And in the last game at Texas Tech, they actually had a 555-42 yard edge, 29 to 21 first down. That just came up on the short end on the scoreboard. But I, th I thought they played a really good game. Actually, had more good plays than Texas Tech did. So I think this is Cincinnati team off a of bye. Uh, going down to Central Florida, that's that's got a chance of pulling the upset here. I like the Bearcats to come out of there with the win. Arizona making the trip to Provo to take on the BYU Cougars, the undefeated Cougars. Huh. Uh, maybe the, the storyline of the Big 12 or maybe most of college football right now. Um, Arizona, on the other hand, they haven't been as high-powered or high-octane as you would have thought offensively. Noah Fafita's got, I believe, six interceptions. His completion percentage is way down from what it was a year ago, although it's still above 60%. Can Arizona go into BYU and hand them their first loss of the year? You know, I when I uh, handicap a game, what I do is I, I usually go through the season, and I go, okay, you got a good game, bad game, good game, bad game. How many good games a team has? Well, how about BYU? I feel they've had five <laughs> good games out of five. Uh, and, and frankly, they surprised me by upsetting SMU. Uh, blowing out Wyoming, upsetting Kansas State, 
And then uh, beating Baylor on the road. They've had really good matchups. They're at home. They're in the altitude. They're for a second straight week, which actually heightens the altitude advantage. When you look at Arizona, I mean, they didn't have a great first half against New Mexico. It was uh, 306 to 305 yards. Uh, Wasn't overwhelming against Northern Arizona. Had a really poor second half against Kansas State. And Texas Tech, they were down uh, 18 to 3 at the half and ended up losing 28-22. As you mentioned, Fafita, just a 7-6 ratio this year. Stark contrast to last year when he had a 25 to 6 ratio. So I, I BYU's only laying three and a half. I don't think they're quite getting the respect they deserve right now. I love the home field edge as well. I'm going to take BYU in this one to win it by about a touchdown or more. 18th ranked Kansas State rolls into Boulder to take on Dion and the Buffs. Uh, Phil, maybe kind of similar to like I, you know, we said in the Cincinnati UCF game, an opportunity for one of these teams to separate both four and one. Kansas State ranked, like I said, 18th, could move up into the top 15 potentially if they win this. Colorado could be 5-1 and one and potentially find themselves ranked if they're able to take care of business at home. Uh, can the Buffs get this one done and keep that kind of early season momentum going? Or is uh, K-State put their foot down and maybe continue to, to look like the team that we thought they would? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, if... Colorado wins this game. I am going to change my uh, outlook on Colorado for this year. No doubt about it. Deion Sanders is three and zero as a home dog. So it's a dangerous Mm -hmm. spot for K state, but I still feel line of scrimmage dominant edge to Kansas state. They can run the football. They have an outstanding offensive line. They've got an outstanding defensive front seven. Where's Colorado's deficiencies. I would say it's on the offensive line uh, where they're struggling to run. They only average 81 yards per game on the ground. They've given up, uh, 9% sacks this year, 18 sacks when they're, they're throwing the ball. And defensively, they're not that strong either. So I, I think K-State holds a significant edge at the line of scrimmage. Now, Shadur Sanders, a tough quarterback to go against. He's at home. Uh, they've got Shiloh Sanders back again. Uh, and Travis Hunter is there, of course. He, he could very well win the Heisman this year. But I just think Kansas State's a better football team. So I'm going to call for the Wildcats to go on the road and get the win, once again, by about a touchdown or more. And for the game that we're all here for, it's West Virginia and Iowa State. The coal rush, 8 o'clock kickoff under the lights. This is the third time now that West Virginia has played on a big stage. They did it against Penn State and failed miserably. Pitt, they had a chance to win the game. They blew it at the end. This feels like the third time's a charm. Maybe. We'll see. Iowa State coming in 5-0, and top 15 team in the country, looking for their second 6-0 and start in program history. West Virginia had too good of a week last week, Phil, for I think a lot of West Virginia fans to feel good about this game. I think it's it's it just felt like everything went right last week. Can they get enough things to go their way this week in a big-time showdown against the Cyclones? Well, as you know, last week I told you I liked West Virginia, and they, they didn't disappoint. And the thing that amazed me, Skyler, was that – uh, they ran for 389 <laughs> yards in that game, but it wasn't like 75 yard runs that got them there. I mean, the longest run of the game was 30 some odd yards. The longest touchdown run was 15 yards. That's just domination at the line of scrimmage and you had to love it. But as you mentioned, uh, everything did go right for them last week and they're taking on a much tougher opponent than Iowa state. In fact, Iowa state might just be the best team in the big 12 this year. In fact, when I went over the team with coach Campbell, uh, this preseason, uh, we went over every position and at, at the end, I always ask, you know, okay, how do you feel about the quarterbacks? How do you feel about the running backs? You know, once we go through every player and it seemed like he wrapped up every position with this is the best we've been at this position, or this is the most experienced we've been at this position, or this is the deepest we've been at the position since I've been here. And when I got off the phone with him, I thought, well, this is the best team he's had since he's been at Iowa State. They're 5-0, and and they're handling the favorites role well. I, I love the way they went into Iowa, came out with a win. Uh, they did need a late comeback to get that one, but uh, this is an Iowa State team that's extremely difficult. I'm not going against Iowa State, but I'm not going against West Virginia either, especially at home. So I think this is going to be a toss-up game, come down to the wire, decided by a field goal one way or the other. Bill, uh, you know, for the Mountaineers, if they're going to have success, um, you know, Matt Campbell has now played Neil Brown three times in the the Neil Brown and Morgantown era. Iowa State scored 30 or more points in all of those meetings. So the Mountaineers need to slow down the Cyclones, something they haven't done very well as of late. Uh, that front that the Mountaineers have with TJ Jackson and Sean Martin, guys behind him like Josiah Trotter having the start that he's had, 
Um, do you think the Mountaineers once again, I mean, they did a pretty solid job against Kansas of living, limiting Devin Neal in a solid run game. They did a really good job against Oklahoma State, Ollie Gordon in a solid run game. Can they do it for a third straight week? Yeah, I think they can slow down the run game. I guess where I, my biggest concern would be would be the pass defense. We've seen some uh, problems there the, so far this year. Rocco Beck comes in with a 9-3 ratio, and Iowa State usually doesn't have dynamic players at the receiver position, but they've got some this year. I like uh, Jalen Knoll. I like Jaden Higgins, and, of course, they've always got the tight ends that can hurt you. Uh, I do think they'll slow down Iowa State's run game, but I, I'm a little concerned about the pass uh, pass defense. Yeah, and you also got to wonder, too, about Rocco Beck having that extra little chip on his shoulder, <laughs> not getting that that hard recruiting pitch from Neil Brown and, and his father's alma mater. So we'll see how things play out between West Virginia and Iowa State. Again, kicking off at 8 o'clock under the lights on Fox. Cole Rush should be a great atmosphere. Phil, we appreciate you taking out some time once again to join us here on this week's episode of ITG. Hey, Wes, Skyler is a lot of fun as usual. And uh, go, let's have a great weekend, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Phil. We appreciate you, Phil. And stay tuned. We're going to have to make our picks for this weekend's game. On the other side, you are in the gun. There are better known tractors in the world than Coyote. Ones with bigger names, longer histories, more popular hats, cute toy lines. But there's not a single tractor ever been built that's better equipped to do the dirty work. So we'll just focus on what really matters. Coyote, we dig dirt. Now at Johnston Equipment, get 0% financing for 72 months, plus a free loader on select Coyote models in stock. Visit us on Route 33 between Weston and Buchanan. Back in the gun and great stuff as always from Phil Steele. It's, he, he calls West Virginia and Iowa State what uh, I think we all would like to say is a popcorn game. Uh, if you've been watching <laughs> Phil Steele for a while now, he just likes the, the games he doesn't really have an opinion on. It's a popcorn game. Sit back and just relax and watch. I wonder, it, but, uh, too, you know, that's a that's a uh, that's a thing that Mike Tomlin uses from time to time as well. Yeah. So I wonder who came up with the popcorn thing first. Was it Mike Tomlin or was it did Phil steal it from That's Tomlin or did question. Tomlin steal it from Phil? I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to look deeper into this. Yeah, we're gonna have to ask <laughs> Phil next week. And uh, I don't know, like when I saw the spread, I, I kind of figured it would be three and a half. Is kind of what my thought was. And that it's just been hanging around two and a half for a while. Just my experience in, in betting. Anytime I've ever bet a road favorite at two or two and a half, it always feels like that team loses the game. I don't know why, because it's it's almost just like they're begging you to take it with the field goal being there. So I, I don't know. Hopefully that's the case, but we'll see. Um, before we get into this week's picks, a final thank you to Johnson's Equipment. Get 0% financing for up to 72 months with approved credit on select Coyote tractors in stock now at Johnston Equipment, Route 33 between Weston and Buck Cannon. So, Wes – your debut on the season of the ITG Sportsbook segment here. We are going to go with Iowa State quarterback Rocco Beck is averaging 8.9 yards per attempt, which is third highest in the Big 12. Impressively, Beck has averaged 11 yards per attempt in six of his last eight games. The WVU defense is allowing 8.8 .8 yards per attempt, which is 15th in the Big 12. So the question is, does Rocco Beck go over or under nine yards per attempt? Hmm. I'm gonna go close, like right at it, but under. I'm gonna I'm gonna go under. I they've got the talent, they've got the weapons. We just heard Phil still talk about it. He doesn't worry about WVU defense being able to slow down the Iowa State run game, but it's the pass game that worries him. <sighs> I, I just think the defensive front for WVU has proven that it can be disruptive against just about anybody. And if that happens, I don't think he's going to have the time to sit back there and throw the ball 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 yards downfield consistently. Close, but I'll yeah. go slightly under. It wouldn't surprise me if he's at like 8.5. I think it'll be very close. But I just don't think he's going to have the time to sit back there and, and, and wait for those intermediate routes to develop consistently. I'm with you. I, Oklahoma State, like we said earlier in the show, they had only given it one sack all year. They gave up two to West Virginia. Similar situation here. Iowa State's offensive line is really good. But I think, too, with Iowa State, they're not going to be somebody that's going to have a, an opportunity to take a whole lot of shots downfield. If you look at their distribution in the passing game, it's really two guys, Jalen Noel and Jaden Higgins. That's it. Yep. 
Yep. And I think what Jordan Leslie is going to do is pretty much a similar game plan to what they did against Kansas and just kind of dare them to run the football, have a lighter box, protect their secondary. They're, they're going to try and keep everything in front. They don't want to get beat on these deep shots down the field and have them just open up the whole offense. So right. I think you're right, right in that, and that it'll stay under nine yards per attempt. Uh, question two. Um, so WVU is the only offense in the Big 12 that is averaging more than 215 yards passing and rushing per game. The Iowa State defense has a streak of 33 straight games, not allowing a team to pass and rush for over 215 yards. So the question is, will the WVU offense Saturday night pass and rush for 180 yards or more in both categories? So Jed uh, kind of tweaked the line there on us. Mm. I like it from yes. a passing perspective. I'm a little nervous about the running. I'm going to go yes. I am a little nervous about the running as well, too. But I think we, man, these last these last two games, I almost said last two weeks, but there was the bye week in there, but you get what I'm saying. These last two yeah. games, we've really started to see Garrett use his legs more. And I think that's the difference. I think if you can get one of Jaheim and CJ up over 100 yards again, you know, the other has 60, 70. I think Garrett Green throws in hopefully 40, 50, and you – can start to that that's what I really hope Sky if they can start to hit that 200 rushing yards per game mark like they did pretty consistently last year down the stretch starting around this time it's gonna be a tough offense to slow down and uh, yeah. I think they've got the front to do it they got the two running backs and the quarterback to do it I'll go over I'll go over <laughs> I'm gonna hold my breath with this one and say over as well um I just think that the running game has found it's groove. I don't want to say it's found its answers because they've been able to run the ball pretty much all year, but sure. it's it's just seeming like it's coming a little easier for them. And you're right. Like this was around the time last year. I, I go back to the Houston game a year ago, although we don't like to talk about it, <laughs> but that was really kind of the, the coming out party for the offense when they really started to turn the corner. It's about that same time of year this year. And I think we're going to start to see some more things from the old two. There's going to be more eye candy and stuff that, that happens pre-snap, I feel. Um, you're going to have to, I feel like, to just kind of get a better picture of what Iowa State's crazy defense is going to present you. So I think they do get over 180 uh, rushing. Passing, I think it's going to be really close because I, I think they're going to have to really lean on the run game in this one. But I, I feel like Garrett will have a couple of explosive passing plays. Um Actually, you know what? To make it interesting, I'll go under on the passing. Ooh. So if you think about Iowa State's defense, they want to keep everything in front, too. It makes it really challenging for the quarterbacks. And They want you to, they want you to have to paper cut them to death. Yes. Like dink and dunk your way down the field. Yep. And you go back to that 2018 game against Iowa State, and I just I, – I can't get that game out of my head. That offense was humming along every single week. They go in there and they they look like they couldn't know how to they didn't know how to football, Wes. I mean, it, it was ridiculously bad. Um, same defensive coordinator, same defensive scheme. So I'll go under on that to keep it a little interesting. So final question here. Um, Jed leads us in with the, for the second straight year, Iowa State is number one in the Big 12 in turnover margin at plus seven. West Virginia is minus three this year, but plus two in the last two games. When the Mountaineers under Neil Brown win the turnover margin at home, they are undefeated, a perfect 9-0. and oh. So, will WVU buck the odds and win the turnover margin on Saturday night? No. Mm. Uh-oh. No. Listen, as much as I am a WVU homer, as much as I look at everything through old gold and blue glasses, or even black, I can't... Black. Or black. Or black. Yes, if you're wide wearing the, the black hard hat again. Uh Whole rush glasses as it pertains to this conversation. Skyler, this is one of those like, you know, everybody's like, hey, the SEC is loaded this year, but I'm still going to believe it's going to be Alabama and Georgia at the end until proven yep. otherwise. You know, like when Tom Brady was with the Patriots, I'm going to pick the Patriots to win the Super Bowl or at least be in the Super Bowl until proven otherwise. There's a lot of things within this six year sample size that we know about WVU football under Neil yeah. Brown. And one is that we don't win the turnover margin very often. It's been one of the things that's driving me crazy. I've talked about it here on the podcast. Now, I will say 
The last two weeks in Big 12 play, been better in that department. You forced multiple turnovers against Kansas. You forced multiple turnovers against Oklahoma State. Do it three times, and they call that a streak, and I'll really start <laughs> believing. <laughs> but with how good Iowa State is traditionally under Matt Campbell, historically under Matt Campbell, at not turning the ball over, and how we've struggled in that department defensively, um, albeit aside from the last two weeks, I'm going to go with no, WVU does not win the turnover margin Saturday night, as much as I hope that I'm wrong. And if I am wrong, I think we have a great chance to win this game. Even if it's just even, Skyler, yeah. just keep it even. We have a great chance to win this game. Uh, but I I can't argue with history, so I got to go no. <laughs> that reminds me of Lou Brown from Major League with the winning streak. That's exactly what I was we going We two for in a row, and if we win Let's one Let's force tomorrow... multiple turnovers three <laughs> in a row. You know what they call that? A turnover streak. Exactly. Uh, Has been done before. before. <laughs> I I don't know. I think the turnovers the last two games are a little skewed, and I don't want to take anything away from the defense, but Jalen Daniels has had issues with protecting a football all year. Alan Bowman's had issues with protecting a football the last two years. And really one of the two interceptions that he had, the one that Trotter pulled down near the sideline, he could have just – throwing that – I mean, it was fourth down, so he wouldn't have thrown it away, but it was kind of a gimme interception. I don't really sure. think there was sure. much of a a takeaway yeah. as much of it yeah. was a, just a bad throw. So I, I don't think that they're going to win the turnover margin. I'm with you here. I, I think this has kind of been a, a, a theme over the years, especially in these bigger games on the bigger stage. I, I, I don't want to jinx it and have it come true, but it feels like this is one of those days where something stupid like – you, uh, 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 your own guy runs into the punt returner and you muff a punt. And all of a sudden you give Iowa State great field position, a short field to go down and score. Hopefully that's not the case. But I'm going to say, no, they don't win the turnover margin. And maybe I'll throw in a little caveat here. May I'd like to see the odds on this, Jed. Work this one up. Uh, <laughs> turnover margin is is even. So I'll take whatever that odds, those odds are. Okay. So listen, like if, if it's even, I think I think that's fine. They have that, a chance. I, yeah. If you, I'd sign for that in blood right now if it's even. Yeah. Like no team turns the ball over, or maybe we first force a turnover, they force a turnover type thing, and it's even at one and one, fine. But if if you do that, you still I think have a a solid chance to win this game. But it's just like you said in the in these quote unquote big games where WV has come up just a little bit short so often that's been the difference. Look at the backyard brawl this year, you know, look at the Houston game last year. Uh, just <sighs> if you would have been able to get your hand on one football of Eli Holston in the pocket, when he's dancing around like a dingus, if you would have been able to get underneath one rainbow ball that was thrown uh, against Houston, if you don't, you know, fumble in the stinking end zone as you're about to score, all these different things. Um, just don't let that happen on Saturday night at home. Simple, right? Just don't yeah. let that happen. Just don't do it. Yep. Real simple. The, Easy for me to say. I'll actually throw one more in here. So this wasn't even on the card, but I, I'm going to throw it in here because I think this was a crucial part of last week's game, and, and I talked about it the last two weeks, really. Time of possession, West Virginia was number one in the Big 12 last year in time of possession. This year, heading into the Oklahoma State game, they were averaging like 26 or 27 minutes of, of ball control. That's about three and a half minutes less of what they had a year ago. They held the ball for 42 minutes last week, Wes. When you do that, I mean, there's – Your defense almost, is going to make some plays. Yeah. There, like, there's they're going to no, be so, they're gonna be so fresh, they're going to make some plays. There, there's going to be almost no chance of you losing a game like that unless your defense is just getting gashed on 50-yard uh, plays every or time. Or you're turning the ball over three yes. or four times. Yeah. So, Iowa State comes into this game fifth in the Big 12 at 31 minutes and 34 seconds. West Virginia at 31 minutes, 17 seconds. We're splitting hairs here. So, I'll put it quite simple as this. Who wins the, t the time of possession battle? The Mountaineers. Because we have to. I mean, like, yeah. I don't think we're going to win the turnover battle. At You know, at best, we'll be a stalemate in that regard. If we lose the turnover battle and we lose the time of possession battle, you're going really to real, you're gonna need some real <laughs> fluky things to happen, right? Like, you're going to yeah. need a kick or a punt return touchdown, like something like that, uh, you know, to happen. Um, yeah, so... 
I think with. they I think they have to win the the it, it, with with how the turnover battles have gone, margins have gone, and particularly how Iowa State is in that department. I think they have to win the time of possession. Yep, I'm with you there too. I think they do win it, and I think partially because I think the defense is doing a better job in getting off the field on third down. Agreed. And they're they're going to be starting, aggressive. We're starting to do a better job of moving the sticks on third down yes. too. And I know as Jed is laid out, we are an aggressive fourth down team, so a exactly. lot of times third down. But that doesn't mean you still can't move the sticks on third down more often either and not have to get <laughs> we don't the have fourth to get down. There. They've been doing a better better job of that too. Yeah, I, I think they'll be aggressive in this game. I think you'll see multiple fourth down conversions uh, or multiple fourth down attempts by Neil Brown. So, yeah, I, I think they will win the time possession, mainly because, like you said, they have to to even have a chance to win this game. So that's going to do it for us here today and for this week on ITG. We'll have episode 200, big 200 uh, to kick off next week as we recap the game between West Virginia and Iowa State, hopefully in a happy fashion. Uh, we beat, make sure we beat that. Iowa. We beat Iowa State. I'm going to drink 200 beers on episode 200. <laughs> on the okay, way, maybe back. not, maybe not quite 200, but close. On the way back from Vegas, uh, Wes will will have a, a quite a time out there. Probably, well, I don't know, win or lose, he might be he might be boozing, but we'll see. That's going to do it for us this week. Make sure you hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube page. Give us a follow on X at the same handle at In The Gun Podcast. And that'll do it for us today. So, as always, be in here and tell in here about your new favorite WWE football podcast. You are In The Gun. I-T-G. The fun doesn't have to stop here. Be sure to hit subscribe and never miss an episode. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, be sure to follow us on X at In The Gun Podcast. Join us again next time. Until then. Tell an ear to tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast. This mission is over. It's over.